Mm. So the simple math says if each one of us invests 12.5 billion more on top of what we have, that makes up the 75 million. So keep that in mind and listen to us carefully. Let's see if we can come up with 12.5 billion dollars each. Easier for city, maybe a little bit tougher for the for the rest of us. So first of all, I would like to introduce my um, panelists. Sera Akçoğlu, on my immediate left, is the first woman and Turkish CEO and board member for Citibank Turkey. In addition to her current role, Sera is responsible for 60 other countries in EMEA region, where City doesn't have physical branches or subsidiaries, but provides corporate banking services. Previously, Sera was the EMEA trade services and finance head for City's global transaction services based in London. In this role, she was responsible for trade finance and the regional strategy of the trade products, new product development, and positioning 50 countries located in this wide region. Prior to joining City, Sarah held various managerial positions at Koch Bank and Manufacturers Hanover and Chemical Bank. She is currently the chairwoman of AMCHAM, American Business Forum in Turkey, board member of Turkish Industry and Business Association, TÜSİAD, and board member of the Bank Association of Turkey. Sera, welcome. We're honored and delighted to have you with us. Thank you so much, Janan. Thank you for your great introduction. Thank you. Um, I'm also very happy to introduce Mr. Douglas Parks. He joined Dow in 2010 as the Global Business Director for Lightweight Materials and Government Markets. In this role, he was responsible for developing Dow's global strategy in lightweight materials with a specific focus on industrial applications, including wind, transportation, civil infrastructure, and defense. In 2012, he led the negotiations with Turkey-based AXA Acrylic, the world's largest acrylic fiber manufacturer, that resulted in the formation of Dow AXA, a 50-50 joint venture between Dow and AXA for the production of carbon fiber and carbon fiber composites. He held various other positions in, in Dow, and he comes to Dow with more than 25 years of experience in the US military and in various market development and government development roles in Michigan. We are delighted to have Douglas Parks talk about the investments of Dow in Turkey. On, on his left, we have Mr. Tarkan Gürgan of PepsiCo. Tarkan Bey is the Senior Vice President of Corporate m and at Pepsi, a position he assumed in September 2010. He is responsible for identification, evaluation, and execution of acquisitions and business alliances globally at PepsiCo. He reports to Hugh Johnston, Chief Financial Officer. In addition, Tarkan is the Senior Vice President of the Global Franchise Leadership Team. He provides financial guidance and governance and helps set the stage as the team forms the global franchise function. He has spent his last 20 years in the food and beverage industry, executing numerous acquisitions, divestitures, and alliances. He joined PepsiCo from Campbell's Soup Company, where he held the M&A function since 2008 as Vice President of Corporate Development. He began his career in food and beverage industry at PepsiCo International with M&A and planning roles. He was located in Purchase, New York, and he graduated from Amos Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth College with a Master of Business Administration, and before that, our beloved Bosphorus University. Welcome, Tarkambe. And this brings us to Mr. Van Uter from Cargill Incorporated. He is the Vice President of Corporate Affairs in Cargill. He joined Cargill's Washington DC office in June 1999 as International Business Development Director and was also named head of Cargill's Washington operations in 2002. 
Before that, Mr. Utar worked in Cargill Strategy and Business Development Group in business and corporate strategy, mergers, acquisitions, and capacities. Based in Melbourne, Australia from 95 to 99, I'm jealous, Mr. Uter initially served as commercial manager and then became executive director of Cargill Australia. He graduated magna cum laude from Vanderbilt University in 1987 and earned a master's degree in business and international relations from University of Chicago, 1990. Welcome, Mr. Van Uter. And last but not least, Ms. Aisham Sargon, the Managing Director and Country Executive for Boeing in Turkey. Aisham was appointed as the Managing Director and Country Executive for Boeing in September 2015. Prior to Boeing, she was the Government Affairs and Policy Director for General Electric in Turkey, where she set and led the company's government engagement and policy strategies. The focus was on expanding growth across all GE businesses. Previously, she worked as external affairs manager for British Petroleum Turkey, and before that, she worked more than 10 years in the United States Embassy in Ankara as senior economic advisor. She graduated from Middle East Technical University Economics Department. She was recently also elected as the president of the International Investors Association, YASET, where she previously served as a board member. She is also on the board of ABFD and TED Ankara College. You can see from uh, these introductions that I am really blessed to have such a great panel this morning. Not only these companies are capable of investing $12.5 billion each to make both presidents of our countries proud, but they also bring a deep wealth in international business, investment, mergers, and acquisitions. Exactly what we need. We are all members of MCHAM. We are all investors and global companies, and let's see what they have to tell us. I would like to start by asking Ms. Sarah Akçoğlu. Sarah, as City, you have been a great supporter in telling Turkey's investment story to international investors. During tough times, you know the financial sector very well, and you are instrumental in connecting Turkey to global funds. Please summarize the current financial environment in and around Turkey from investment point of view. Thank you. Janan, thank you so much for a tremendous introduction. Uh, first of all, many thanks to ATC and to Tai for this organization and our esteemed guests and uh, for the conference and being here all together with our panelists. A couple of things. This is a topic that we spend enormous time on as City, as AmCham, in all these different capacities that we're in, because all of us talk to many investors on a daily basis. What are the critical points? I think what's really unique about Turkey, and I truly do believe, because City is in 100 countries around the world, so we have the chance of monitoring 100 countries around the world. What makes Turkey unique is, I think, and I truly do believe in this, is the diversity. It's a diverse population. It is diverse industries. We're not only dependent on one industry. By the way, I wish we had oil, but we don't as much as we could. So again, I think diversity is one of the instrumental factors which makes Turkey economy extremely dynamic. And because of that, I'll move on to resilience. Because of that, the economy is resilient. We've gone through so much. We've all gone through so much over the last couple of years. I cannot think of many economies around the world who can still be where we are. And let me move on to the other point. Next point after diversity is a very, very strong banking industry. And we have many strong banks, of which 
one of them is I can see in front of us and happy to see, you know, woman talent uh, at senior management levels at Garantia at Ebru. But many banks who have top talent and who are very strong financially, and why is that? Because Turkey went through a banking consolidation in year 2000. After that, we have really a very strong banks, you know, approximately 50 banks in the country with strong financials. And again, another very important point. Since January this year, to Janan's very uh, important question, the country has been able to bring in, and I don't think this is much talked about, we've been able to bring in over $11 billion of financing into the country through the equity markets, through bonds, through equity issuances, for banks, for the Undersecretary of Treasury, for corporate co companies. This doesn't happen coincidentally. Numbers talk for themselves. We bankers like numbers. So I think what's really unique, I mean, don't we have challenges as a country? Absolutely we do. Isn't there any, is there any country around the world who doesn't have any challenges? I don't think there is. I don't think the critical point is whether we have challenges or not. The critical point is, are we as a country able to handle the challenges? Are we able to work together, to work through the challenges? I think that's the most important point. And I don't, this is a topic that I, is dear to my heart. I don't want to continue to talk too long. I'd love to hear our panelists, but I, I hope this is a, a start to further discussions throughout the panel. Thank you so much, John Allen. Thank you, Sarah. So we have heard about dynamism, resilience, and structural strength of banking and financing industry in Turkey. It is really great to hear that because we are counting on access to financing to continue our investments and to, to increase them. Uh, let's go to Mr. Douglas Parks from Dow AXA. In the current structure, Dow AXA is a great example of growing investments and also in line with great incentive programs Turkey has. It is everything that we ask for. It is manufacturing, it is high value added jobs, it is new technologies, it is supporting value added export opportunities, everything that Turkey could ask for. We would like to hear you talk about incentives, what works, what doesn't, and what affects your incentive appetite. So we know financing is number one, closely followed by government incentives supporting, um, and that makes a big difference in where global companies' investments go to. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Chenan. Distinguished guests. When we originally planned to sponsor at the conference, I thought there was one of two results. One, I would be here to complain about our progress, or number two, I would be here to announce great results. So we're somewhere in between, but I think within a couple of weeks, we will have very big news. First, uh, the JV. Uh, I am the CEO of Dow AXA. Dow AXA is a 50-50 joint venture between Dow Chemical, located in over 200 locations globally, and AXA Acrylic, the world's largest acrylic fiber manufacturer. The logic for our joint venture early, and I was the lead negotiator, was that AXA, being the world's largest acrylic fiber manufacturer, which is the raw material for carbon fiber, was the ideal partner for Dow, bringing both the chemistry solutions as well as market channels. We knew when we did the joint venture that there were a couple of things that would be key to hit our targets, which w were and are to be the world's low-cost producer of all types of carbon fiber, and also to be able to expand our, our, our reach globally. Uh, it, the energy was a big issue. So back in 2012, when we formed the joint venture, we started with capacity of 3,500 tons. We're still at that level. We struggled for a number of years to try to solve the energy issue. I think we had numerous meetings at all levels, and everybody was trying to do the right thing. Um, and as you know, carbon fiber is a strategic material, and as I listened to the talks over the last two days, this is a strategic material for Turkey. And, and regardless of what happens in the world, your raw materials are critical, depending on what happens in terms of your ability to import product. Um, we are the only carbon fiber manufacturer in Turkey, and we're the only carbon fiber manufacturer in the Middle East, or the Near East. Uh, we kind of span the gamut. We have an investment in Moscow, 
We have a major project in Saudi Arabia. So we face a number of the issues, uh, whether it's today's issues or previous issues, but we're very excited because as of last, let me pull this up because I don't want to miss any of the details. In April of 2018, we were awarded with the new project-based incentives program a significant package totaling 2.3 billion Turkish lira to take our current capacity and four exit, basically, taking us to a, a top five producer of carbon fiber in the world. We've struggled over the last year to implement or to finalize the, uh, the investment base, the investment certificate. We hope to have it in the next two weeks. We've made a number of uh, we've made a number of missions to Ankara. I think we resolved most of our issues. I can inform my my comments today. I led business development and attraction for the state of Michigan for a number of years, and I've seen some of the best incentive programs. I will tell you that the tailor-made incentives that the Turkish government is deploying are outstanding. And once we get them done, and once we begin our investment, which will total over $500 million over a couple of years, as well as creating four to 500 jobs in Yelova, Turkey, where I live, we're very excited about the process. We're, we're very excited about what we can do with Turkey first. The one suggestion that I would give with my history is that, and I'll answer that question and the things that, that uh, Turkey can do, you have great power in your offsets. You have great power in your ability to drive local content provisions and all of the tenders you come out with. And we struggled in the U.S. when I was with the state of Michigan to create jobs through our tenders or our, our, our purchases. So one thing I would strongly suggest as we move forward in Turkey together is to work together to make sure that there are local content advantages for companies like ours to recruit the supply chain to have the jobs created that are not just direct but indirect to support the project. But again, when I started my, this journey coming to the conference, we, went, we weren't quite sure what the message would be, but I think within a week or two, and we will talk if we haven't finished this off, we are going to have very good news. Thank you. Thank you. And good luck for the next two years. We know that sometimes with good intentions, long bureaucratic schedules really can frustrate investors. And we'll come back to that in the second round. So Tarkan Bey, welcome again. Um, we know all very well that recently you had a grand opening of a new manufacturing facility, a great investment in our country. Uh, our president in Turkey has also been at the opening and enjoyed the first manufacture uh, of uh, great uh, food products. And this is only the crown jewel in a series of other investments you have made in Turkey. So I would like you to tell us a little bit about your investment journey from past to the present and what this new investment means for PepsiCo. Thank you. Thank you, John. And I'm um, pleased to be here. I'm pleased to represent PepsiCo. Um, I'm sure most of you guys know uh, PepsiCo's uh, businesses, but you know, beverages, you're very familiar, but we do have, you're a global leader in snacks and, and various other categories like Quaker, Gatorade, sport drinks, and Tropicana juices. So all these businesses uh, form about a $65 billion global operations for PepsiCo. Most of these businesses uh, exist in Turkey. We are very, very large footprint, uh, footprint in Turkey as well. Um, our, our businesses um, vary all the way from snacks to beverages to uh, Quaker I've seen on the shelves as well. So we have been committed to the country. We have very uh, long history, about 50 years we've been in the country, never questioned um, the, the growth potential of the country. Um, as you mentioned, John and Anam, uh, we recently opened our sixth plant. Uh, it's a third snack plant, a uh, fairly large plant in Manisa, trade zone, um, um, and, and um, you know, Mr. Uh, President Erdogan uh, graciously and his minister attended the uh, opening of this uh, plant. Um, this plant is a, the story of the plant is we actually made the announcement of publicly the intention to make that investment in late 2016. You know, understand that was a very challenging time for a country. That was a major commitment from PepsiCo. We never wavered, we never questioned that decision. We made it, and here we are, we are here today. This is, um, this employs, this plant will employ about 300 uh, people, going up to 500 in a few years. Um, 
some of our products like Doritos that you're probably familiar, 25% um, or more will be exported from the country to um, neighboring you know, Eastern European countries. So we'll use it as an export base as well. We do have a large uh, presence plant-wise. This is a six plant. We employ 3,000 people in manufacturing, in, in, uh, in sales, in R&D. 40,000 additional people are actually involved in our business, all the way from distribution to agriculture. Um, in agriculture, we, um, you know, we are a major you know, supporter of the uh, raw material. We, we do actually source 100% of our potatoes, 100% of our corn in Turkey. Uh, we, we grow, we provide training um, to, the, to the farmers. Um, so you know, it's, it's an ongoing effort for our PepsiCo business uh, to grow our business, and we, we strongly believe in the growth potential, and we'll continue to invest moving forward. Thank you very much. That's really uh, good to hear, nice to hear. Uh, it gives us more hope for the future. And Mr. Van Uter, as another global investor in Turkey, I would also like to ask you a similar question. You have been investing in Turkey, and you have been growing. Uh, also, you have been investing in many other countries. So as Cargill, when you go to a country, what do you look for to invest? And how do you look at Turkey as an investment environment? It's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, for those of you who don't know Cargill, it's a, a large agricultural and food company. Uh, it's a private company, uh, not publicly traded on a stock exchange. Uh, it's over 150 years old. Uh, and as Kanan said, we're quite a global company and investing all around the world in Turkey. Uh, we've been uh, doing business with Turkey since the 1960s, but mostly in the last 20 years is where we've really started to invest in Turkey. We've uh, invested hundreds of millions of dollars in, in, in the last 20 years and grown our employment base uh, significantly. Um, in terms of kind of what we look for in investment, uh, obviously the things that have been said here before about Turkey are true. Obviously you care, as a food company, you care very much primarily about two things. Uh, where are the people that are consuming food and where is the food grown? So if you look at Cargill's footprint around the world, you'll see a lot of assets where, where there's consumption of food and a lot of assets where there's uh, production of food. Uh, in Turkey, obviously, you've got some of both. Uh, they're growing more and more corn, but it's a, it's a consumption base, a, a large base of, of consumption, and obviously the regional component of Turkey is very interesting, and the growth prospects for the country is, is very interesting. Uh, as a private company, we're, we're able to um, persevere in some markets, uh, sometimes maybe that some of our competitors cannot. We do have a long-term strategic view. We take that very, very seriously. Uh, typically, uh, if you're looking at an investment in a country, um, you look at many microeconomic factors. Oh, you know, what's the cost base and the customers and the competitors and such. I'll just mention two things quickly this morning that are a little different uh, that, that might be a bit interesting. Uh, one thing is, is what I would just call the level, level playing field. Um, often when you invest around, uh, around the world, and I've seen it in, in my career, uh, one of the things that Cargill has had struggles with, and now we've gotten better at trying to identify those locations where the level, the playing field is not level for going in and doing an investment. That could be because of government policy. It could be because of just the dynamics of a specific industry. Um, but if, if, if you don't have a level playing field to compete, that's really problematic for companies. Uh, because you can't win on the merits of what you do well. It's, it's some other artificial reason that leads to the, the people that do well in a business. And the second thing I would say, which, which goes to um, uh, the investment promotion uh, discussion earlier that our, our friend here uh, talked about is, how responsive is the government to issues that come up? No country is perfect, as, as I think you were saying earlier. There's issues in all these countries for investors. And so the question is, when those issues come about, when there's a, a dislocation, when there's a problem, when there's some issue, 
do the countries really want to respond and fix those issues? Do the, do the leaders in the government want to fix those issues, or do they do not? I always, in, in groups like this, when I talk to large groups from different countries, I always say it's, it's funny that all countries want jobs, higher gr economic growth, and for their people, but then sometimes they don't respond, you know, help business succeed. And the only way you're going to get more jobs and have higher economic growth is if the private sector really succeeds and is an engine of that growth. So, so there, it's an important responsiveness of the government to, to help businesses succeed, which is how you're going to get economic growth and higher wages and, uh, and more, more jobs. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you very much. So this brings us to, to Boeing. Aisham. You have very recently announced a new initiative that invests, uh, that represents a new Boeing investments in Turkey. This is yet another example of Turkey's strength in mobilizing investment. And as Sarah pointed out, as Douglas pointed out, as Tarkan pointed out, even in tough times. So we would also like to learn about your very recent investment story and how this came about and how do you see Turkey as an investment destination? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, we announced our investment plan for Turkey back in the, uh, November 2017. And you can imagine it took some time for us to make this announcement. There was a decision process behind it. The decision to grow in Turkey, the decision to make Turkey one of our priority growth, growth countries was made back in 2016, around the end of 2016. And you all remember what the year 2016 was. I think it was one of the most challenging years in Turkey's history. We had to go through multiple terror attacks, one of them hitting Istanbul Atatürk Airport. Uh, we even had a coup attempt economic volatility, it was one of the worst years, really. And imagine how we got to that point and still made Turkey one of our priority growth countries. Every day we were preparing Turkey's strategy, what do we do in Turkey? There was some new news and no good news at all. But um, I think this point about our investment announcement is key and this is probably why and how all these companies prefer to choose to stay in Turkey and grow in Turkey. You have to have a long view on Turkey, and in aviation we had the right story in place, I think. We'll come to why, but I would like to talk a little bit about um, the new approach we had to investing in Turkey too. Traditionally, for those of you who know about our sector, we manufacture planes only in the United States. We work with our global partners, mainly the industrial partners. 65% of our um, airplane cost comes from our global industrial partners. So we work very closely with our supply chain, including in Turkey. We have been in Turkey for 70 years. We have a cumulative work placement stock of $1.8 billion, and this could easily be giving more work to the industry for us. So we could as well say, okay, we work well with the industry, why don't we just grow our industrial engagement in the country? But this time we had a different approach. After we made the investment decision in 2016, we looked at the right formula for Turkey. Because this is a long-term growth market for us, this is a long-term growth country for us, we thought about a long-term view of Turkey. How do we grow Turkey to a place where the growth in aerospace is sustainable and Turkey is always, Turkey remains competitive globally. So we keep working with Turkey as we grow our presence in the region, in Turkey, and also have Turkey as a major resource country in many years to come. So we came up with these four pillars. We knew Turkey, Turkey's strengths. We worked really well with the industry. Turkey has a mature industry that's globally integrated. We are very happy with the delivery uh, schedules. We are very happy with the quality. We have an award-winning company sitting right here, our uh, <laughs> dear partner TAI, 
Dr. Kotil, he has been a great partner, and we have many more other companies. So we thought industry is definitely one key pillar for our strategy in Turkey. And um, the second pillar we thought is technology. We, use, we could see the good talent. We had several research and technology projects going on with several Turkish universities. And there's a good talent pool. You find the right productivity in engineering too. So the second pillar was technology. And last year, we opened our engineering first engineering center in Turkey. It is the seventh globally. So it's not like we open it everywhere. It's one of the few. Um, and then we taught services, MRO, as we call it. Uh, let's use stick to the services. But because of Turkey's location, we definitely use uh, investment offices numbers. Turkey is in a four hour flying distance from 55 countries. That's huge. For aviation, location is key. Turkey is a natural hub. And it doesn't apply to passenger uh, travel only. You can also look at the opportunities there's out there for cargo, opportunities there's out there for services, airplane services. And that also presents us a lot of opportunities for growth, not only in Turkey, beyond Turkey. Um, so with a view in place for all of these different pillars, and finally, the fourth pillar was skilling, advanced skilling, which means this growing sector globally needs skilled labor. We need more pilots, we need, we need more technicians, more engineers, more suppliers. So training is a key part of our um, program, and we brought some simulators, started uh, some joint training programs with Turkish Airlines Academy. So this four-pillar program, we started execution a year ago. It's going really well. One thing that I want to mention uh, here is I have a chart about what happened since we announced and by now. We all know, I don't need to repeat, the several, um, let's say, disheartening <laughs> agenda items that we have in bilateral relations. But despite all these adverse cities, I could see a great partnership between my company and Turkey. So we went through really difficult times. We went through challenging times, and they're never ending. Thank you for not talking about that very issue, but everything is hanging on us. But still, there was this um, mutual understanding, I think, between us, between the Turkish government, the airlines, Boeing, that this is a good program. This is a program that makes Turkey a global player in aerospace. And I saw only partnership and support from the government. We had access to all kinds of incentives. The doors were open to us. We didn't have a moment of grief, a moment of, because of this issue, we can't do this. So I thank all our partners, from the industry to the airline to uh, the government, for this partnership, despite a very challenging environment. We believe in Turkey. Um, and I, I have hopes we'll get over these challenges at some point. I see no reason for not growing further even. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ayşe Hanım. And so we have heard five different stories from five different companies, from five different industries. There is a common theme. They're talking about the resilience of the economy, the strength of the system, the support, the incentives, the dynamic population, the access to talent, the availability of a good consumer base. So we have pockets of opportunity and growth. But we also know that we have serious issues and problems. So we'll have a second round of questions where I will ask each and every one of my guests, what is the one thing from an investor point of view that definitely needs to change? Because Turkey is a country very much open to partnership, like Ayşe Manum said, like joint uh, programs um, from a country point of view as well as local companies. And we want to continue 
to keep doing what we've been doing for the past 50 years, 70 years, 80 years in some case. Um, the story is not a very difficult one to solve. When it was the highest tough time in Turkish-American relationships a few months ago, we asked as AMCHAM organization through Serra Hanım, as Taik organization through Mehmet Ali Alçında Bey, and uh, from Yaset uh, through our president at the time, Ahmet Bey, we asked the president's office, we said we're American companies, we're in a very difficult situation, we would like to have access and audience. Immediately, the president answered us, thanks to Seranum and the other NGOs presidents, we are a well-organized group of 30 American companies. We went to the presidential offices. The president listened to us for over two hours, took copious notes, and he said one thing that's very important. He said that, I don't care where your companies come from. I care that you are in Turkey, investing in Turkey, giving employment, having export opportunities, that benefits my country. For me, whatever happens between the two countries, you will be regarded as Turkish companies, protected, protected and supported as such. That was a very strong message. As business people, we want to know that our investments are safe. On both sides of the Atlantic, we are well protected and kept aside. Politics is politics. There will always be issues. When S-400 is resolved, and I believe it will be, uh, there will be other issues down the road. There has always been. But what's important is to keep the friendship, the trust, and the commercial relationship between two countries. So what do we need to do more? I'm going to do the reverse order. I will start from Aisham again. Briefly, to the point, what is the one thing that you want to have going forward as an investor in Turkey? What should disappear, reappear? Um, if I could, uh, I, I'll go beyond one sentence, please, because I have a realistic we did and very not so realistic time. You wish. You can say <laughs> a couple of sentences. Perfect. So uh, I think in a very, uh, the very short version is we would love to have more predictability. Predictability. Predictability over um, over internal policy making, a, a more open consultation mechanism would be very helpful with the private sector. Uh, I think all doors are open on the government side, but then prior to decision making on certain regulations, laws, I think that open door policy working ahead of time could help us progress more and faster. And the second piece is the less realistic one probably, but geopolitical challenges and geopolit or maybe foreign policy predictability, let's say. Oh. Predictability again. That's tough. If we removed, imagine, as all of our companies, if we removed these challenging agenda items, what, what more could we do together? I mean, in my case, sky is the limit. But now, I think it slows us down. These challenges, these geopolitical challenges that we are going through, and I'm aware this is not a realistic wish, but I wish we could. Mm. I think that would give us a lot of strength. So, Aisha Manam from Boeing suggests that more predictability will support more investments. Predictability in government practices and policies. Also, if possible, in another world with predictability in geopolitical issues. That's a great one. Thank you. And Mr. Van Nuttes. I would just follow on to what I said earlier, that the, the, the support of the government and creating that business environment and a level playing field is critical because I think most companies, Turkey's a very attractive com uh, country and, and we just need to make it such that the, the investors um, uh, are attracted and, and feel supported in the, in the country and, and have a level playing field and I think Turkey will thrive and succeed. Thanks. Thank you very much. So if you wanted to repeat that in 
a phrase or one sentence. What is it? Is it level playing field? Yes. Did I get it? Okay. So we would like to have a more level playing field in terms of versus local industry and companies having the same rights in terms of competitors having the same rights. How do you, I really want it to be crisp and clear and then we'll use them also as ABFD board uh, when we go continue to visit local officials. So can you tell me one more sentence? Yes, as I said before, I think in certain industries there can be a, an unlevel playing field. And, and it's critical, whether it's Turkey or any other country around the world, that what, what determines a successful business is in fact the marketplace and the freedom to operate rather than other Free issues. Free market mechanisms and all of that. Correct. Great, thank you very much. And Tarkan Bey, we want you to continue to invest in Turkey, more factories, more agriculture, exactly what we need. So what do you need? I think I'm going to echo um, the, the, the, you know, the prior speaker's predictability, and I will add transparency. I think you're actually kind of referring transparency. to transparency as well. Um, I've been involved with PepsiCo business and Turkey over the last 25 years. I've seen stellar years. I've seen challenged years, and, and not in a particular order, you know, on and off. Um, Part of that you know, is because of consumer dynamics, and we see that in many countries. We, we do business in 200 countries. I'm not saying this is only Turkey issue. Many countries has uh, the, uh, these, these cyclical businesses. Currency issues, many countries have it. Turkey has it. Um, but on top of that, a uh, little bit on the transparency. We have been hit by some indirect taxes over the last few years in the last minute. For example, soft drink taxes came. Many countries do it, but it came really fast. Um, some environmental packaging taxes, we got hit. These are issues in terms of these business, you know, planning uh, for our sustainability, it's kind of the future vision. You know, when they come too fast without any communication, it actually impacts our business and, and, and delays some of our investment decisions. Great, thank you. So we have predictability, level playing field, transparency, repeated. Mr. Parks, what would you like to add? I would just say whatever you can do to continue to remove the red tape on the incentives program. And I say that because when you have multi-billion dollar investors as shareholders who have the option to locate anywhere in the world, that decisions are made quickly and luckily, you, there are enough advocates in my company, including myself, who love Turkey and tend to stay in Turkey, that we have fought very hard. And I think for our example, we're almost there. But given the situation, the geopolitics today, I wish we had done this a year ago. Uh, I don't think we have an issue. We'll continue to drive. But again, whatever ombudsman services, whatever services that can be provided to help us navigate through, because sometimes the bureaucracy believes that the only job we have is to work on the incentives program. And the, most of us have day jobs. We don't have a lot of time. And we really need the help to work our way through this because we are prepared to invest significant dollars if we can work our way through this quickly. So it is the incentive programs. Yes, we have great competitive incentive programs. But after the application and the, let's say, oral approval, really getting to the execution of the incentive is a gruesome process that takes a long time, that has unclear, undefined rules, and uh, we would really like to have that work more practically, more pragmatically supporting commercial businesses. That's a great one. So I'm also now going to ask uh, Sarah Akçoğlu, what is the one thing that she needs from a banking and financial system point of view. But also, I would like to ask her to use two hats. One, the Citibank CEO hat, and also the MCHAM, TUSIAD, and all the other NGO work that she does. So what does the investors, your customers, and your members in NGOs need to do more of or less of in Turkey? 
Thank you so much, John Adada. Well, our esteemed panelists, I think, covered it all. I will cover something different. Da -da. Let's simplify things. No matter where we sit, we can sit in a public sector job, we can sit in a private sector job, we can be in a bank, we can be in a company. We're human beings. We need to talk. I don't think there's anything in the whole world that people cannot change if they talk honestly, if they talk trusting each other. So if there's two things I ask, one from Turkey and one from US, from the Turkey side, I would love us to continue the partnership, the private sector, public sector partnership, the dialogue, and I think there's a great example of two leaders sitting right in front of me here uh, from our investment, you know, presidency uh, investment um, uh, office, uh, Ahmed Burak Bey with Arda Bey and Bill from uh, the US side that we work again closely. So trade mission, Again, great examples of the two individuals sitting here. We need to continue what we're doing in Turkey with increased public sector, private sector dialogue and to work together. And that's the way we've been able to do it up till now. That's the way that we have been able to handle all of the challenges that we had as a country. We call the regulators on their mobiles. We call the public sector on their mobiles. We call the embassy, the consulate. So, one team in the country, public sector, private sector. The one ask from the Turkey side would be to continue the transparent dialogue, continue the public sector, public, sec public and private sector partnership and take it to the next level. The one thing from the US side is that the example you gave as well as other examples, we have seniors in our country spending enormous time caring and talking about our investments. From the US side, we would love to host from the top, public sector and private sector seniors in our country. Turkey is unique. Unless people come to Turkey, unless they spend hours understanding our investments, understanding the business models, it is very hard to reach from a distance. So the one and only ask from the US side, from the public, public sector and the private sector side, come visit us. Come spend time in our country. We're happy to explain and answer any questions anybody has around the world. Thank you so much. Great. It's, it's, it's really a great message. Very important thing. Constructive dialogue can solve anything. And the one thing that I want as another investor in Turkey, I may be a moderator, but this is important, and that is speed. On both sides, whether it is the US side or whether it is the, the Turkish side, what businesses and investment does not like is uncertainty. A yes is a great answer, but sometimes a very timely, quick no is also a very good and very valuable answer. So speed to execution, speed to decision making, speed to when we agree executing the policies and changes has been discussed is very important. So I would like to thank deeply uh, my esteemed guests. I think it has been a great two round of questions. We've been great with our timing and we still have 15 minutes. At this point, I would like to open up our panel to you. You are why we have prepared, made two rounds of um, preparatory meetings, why we brought our best examples and most concentrated thoughts here. Please ask us anything you would like to know, challenge our views, or you know, we're very happy to answer any questions you may have. <laughs>